morning. Welcome to Ag Day. I'm Al Pell. The vice president today tours the flood-ravaged Midwest. Dairy production is expected to remain steady this year, but prices are forecast to drop. And tobacco production is expected to drop this year, but prices are forecast to hold steady. We'll explain both. Ag Day, brought to you by Mountain Grown Folgers Coffee. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. It's Monday, July 12th. Now fill your cup with coffee and let's take a look at this morning's top stories. Vice President Al Gore today will visit parts of the flood-ravaged Midwest. He wants to see for himself the damage that's estimated to total well over a billion dollars. Gore's promising quick federal action on a one and a quarter billion dollar federal aid package. A disaster relief bill will go to Congress this week and administration sources are predicting quick passage. In addition, Gore says, county by county disaster declarations will be made in the next two weeks. And as a side note, the flooding is affecting the livestock industry. Two slaughterhouses in Denison, Iowa have had to close because the flooding reached the packing plants. The two, owned by Farmland Industries and IBP, may reopen today. And later today, the Ag Department releases its latest update on this year's crops. But the report will not use the June 30th acreage report estimates since the floods have delayed or halted planting for about 10% of the corn and soybean crops. However, amid all this gloomy news is optimism from the Ag Department. The USDA's chief meteorologist, Norton Stroman, says if we get good weather for the last half of July into August, we could still have good yields. For those crops that are not in the low-lying areas that are not flooded out, uh, the combination of cloudy skies and relatively cool temperatures have slowed development. So we're seeing a crop which, uh, while we don't see a lot of the crop except in Minnesota, uh, in what we call poor to very poor condition. A lot of it's in fair condition. It will respond very nicely if we get improved weather. And so the weather during the July, August period is going to really be the key to what this year's crop uh, will turn out to be in terms of yield. But will farmers be able to replant their crops? Stroman says that's unlikely. He predicts that in some states as much as 15 percent of the crop will not be planted this year. The reason that this is so critical in the uh, northwest part of the Corn Belt, not only is this an area which has been prevented uh, planting, uh, uh, even the late planting, but this is also an area which is exposed to the highest probability of having an earlier than normal freeze or a freeze, uh, even a normal freeze at this state still would not allow enough time for the crop to mature. So these farmers really have, have very little option in terms of uh, planting. Analysts are expecting the USDA's crop report today to show a decline in the number of planted acres for corn and soybeans. The private crop firm Sparks Companies estimates that the crop the soybean planted acreage at 59.3 million acres. That's more than 2 million acres less than last month's USDA estimate. And Sparks is predicting corn acres at 74 million. That's just slightly less than the Ag Department forecast last month. Members of the Governor's Ethanol Coalition are meeting today in Chicago. They'll get the results of a study looking at the impact that a 10% blend of ethanol and gasoline will have on ozone formulation. The ethanol industry is still mired in a conflict over whether its use will help or hurt air pollution. The Environmental Protection Agency is scheduled to decide if ethanol should be included in federal orders to clean up pollution in some major cities. Also today, a delegation from China will be in Idaho. They're touring the barley production facilities and talking with Ag Department researchers. China is the fastest growing multi barley importer in the world. Meanwhile, food buyers from India are in Kansas City, Kansas today. They're here to learn about the mechanics and structure of American wheat production, storage, quality assurance, marketing, and transportation. And not to be left out, a delegation from Russia is in the U.S. inspecting pork production facilities. Now, this is the end result of a conflict between the two countries over the safety of U.S. pork. The Russians in April banned imports of U.S. pork, saying it is not certified as being free of trichinosis. A decision on whether to lift a ban is expected after the group returns to Russia next week. Meanwhile, the Ag Department expects that meat imports this year will be too low to trigger a quota or other device to protect domestic producers. Total imports in 1993 are expected to be just over one and a half and that is one and a quarter billion pounds. That's about 100,000 pounds less than a trigger amount. And next, 
Can man improve on nature? Well, take a look at this wetlands in Mississippi. The people who build it say they did a better job than Mother Nature. The story a little later on Ag Day. producers are struggling to survive. The prices they get for milk have been flat for a number of years, but production costs are rising. Unfortunately, USDA economist James Miller says the situation isn't expected to change this year. We expect that milk cow numbers will continue to decline at about a 1% rate, a moderate rate. Milk per cow will be going under a year earlier very shortly simply because we are not experiencing a repeat of the very favorable weather that we had through the summer of 1992. Milk production during the summer will be somewhat below a year earlier, possibly coming back closer to a year earlier towards the end of the year. For the year as a whole, we expect milk production to be about the same, maybe just barely below a year earlier. And Miller says dairy prices are expected to fall in spite of the reduced production. It's the reverse for tobacco growers. Ag Department economist Werner Greis says production will drop this year, primarily due to cheap imports. But prices are expected to hold steady. Well, tobacco production was up in 1992. We anticipated that it will be down in uh, 1993. Uh, primary reason that it will be, be down is because of increase in imported leaf. Uh, cigarette manufacturers are using more and more imported, cheaper imported leaf in their uh, uh, discounted brands of cigarettes, which are, are gaining a larger share of the market. Both developers and environmentalists are eyeing a wetlands near Pascagoula, Mississippi. It's new, but the question is, is it also improved? Reporter Tyson Garris says their answer will affect all coastal areas where development is underway. Mississippi State University Marine Resource Specialist Dr. Mark LaSalle spends much of his time mucking around marshland. His work is being done near the Pascagoula, Mississippi Chevron Refinery, where the company created about 30 acres of marshland to replace wetlands filled in as part of an expansion project. It's now saltwater marsh. We actually excavated it down so that it would become tidal and then uh, planted marsh grass, and uh, we're real pleased with the with the results. LaSalle's study compares constructed marshes with natural marshes. Largely in terms of whether or not it has the same plants and animals that you typically find in a natural marsh. And whether or not the system as a whole provides similar functions. LaSalle's study is important because little is known about whether constructed wetlands support wildlife and fish as well as natural wetlands. The key here is that we're trying to compare them for the first time to see how well they compare to each other. Wetlands construction is one option to developers who fill in wetlands. If LaSalle study shows constructed wetlands perform as well as natural wetlands, federal officials may allow more developers to fill in wetlands provided they build new ones. We can't just go out there and say, well, I've got, you know, six different kinds of fish and, the, you know, I've got more or less here. We need to get some good numbers. LaSalle is confident his two sampling techniques will yield the good numbers that are needed. He says preliminary results show plant growth and survivability seem comparable between natural and constructed marshes. It's still too early to tell about the fish, shrimp, animals, and mammals. Similar studies are being conducted in other parts of the country. They'll continue for another two years. From Pascagoula, Mississippi, this is Tyson Gear reporting for Ag Day. And now with a look at the first of the week weather, our very own Mississippi native, Wendy Howell. Hey, all right. Hot and dry, wet and muggy. Now those are some terms that are going to be frequent across the nation today. I'll have 
all the details coming up on an extended forecast coming up on the weathercast. Okay, Wendy's weather is next, so stay tuned. Weather is brought to you by Mountain Grown Folgers Coffee. Folgers, the best part of waking up. Good morning. All these hot temperatures may speed the ripening up for some wheat, fruits, and vegetables across the nation, but some crops further in the south may be stressed by all the heat. Waves of low pressure have been riding along the frontal system, and this front has managed to dip a little bit further down south over the weekend. But what's happened is that it's pushed the precipitation northward, so it looks like rain, more rain is going to enter the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. These states are going to receive some of the heavier showers today. Still some showers linger along the Gulf Coastal states they'll receive around a quarter to a half an inch of rainfall and the southern Appalachians may receive some spotty showers. Temperatures are really going to begin to rise and it's going to be a little stifling further down south. So if you plan to transport any livestock, remember the livestock safety index is going to reach the danger to alert category today and it's best to transport early in the morning or in the late evening hours. Let's take a look at these overnight lows. These are the temperatures so you might want to put the fan in the windows. Leave the windows open. 70 degree temperatures pretty warm and dominate most of the eastern half of the nation. We're going to have cooler temperatures in the Pacific Northwest and over the northern Rockies. Temperatures dropping down into the 40s and the 50s. And it looks like some of these areas could use some of the warmer weather, but I don't think they're going to get any of that anytime soon. The 6 to 10 day forecast will show continued cooler temperatures across the Northwest. Much of the east will have above normal temperatures and in the states where they really don't need warm temperatures, they're still going to find some in South Carolina and Georgia. Rain across much of the Pacific Northwest corn and soybean region and over the next 30 day forecast in much of the eastern half of the nation will still continue to find very warm temperatures and it's going to be soggy across the same regions that you will find in the 6 to 10 day forecast. The Pacific Northwest, the spring wheat areas and some of the corn and soybean regions. Let's take a look at your folders forecast for the day. And in Athens, Georgia, partly cloudy skies with a high of 93. In Dodge City, Kansas, partly cloudy skies, the high of 94. At KTWO in Casper, Wyoming, look for lots of sunshine. And in Minneapolis, cloudy skies with a high of 76. Well, it looks like those areas that have been real wet are also going to add several degrees of temperature. Oh, humid. a little hot and humid. And if you could just push some of those uh, precipitation amounts a little bit further to the southeast, it sure would make some people happy. No, I'm sure it would. Thank you, Wendy. We've told you how the rains are affecting crops. Well, here's a new weather worry, heat. Analyst Jim Bauer explains when Ag Day continues. Our guest this morning is Jim Bauer, Bauer Trading. Jim, let's talk a little bit about corn. Uh, a team went uh, all the way through Iowa, Illinois, uh, well, through the Corn Belt, and they said that corn, except for that that's underwater, looks a lot better than they were anticipating for this time of year, uh, although the corn market jumped a little bit. Well, Al, the corn market has followed on the heels of the soybean market okay. to a certain degree. 
but I think the thing that we must keep in mind is that the corn crop essentially got planted. The bean crop, essentially a good portion of it, uh, particularly in the western corn belt, did not get planted. That is actually the critical price making determinant that we've seen. But from this level on, again, I think it's going to be weather. But going back to corn, uh, you and I both can, have driven around through the, particularly the eastern corn belt, and there are some very, very good looking fields of corn, in, particularly in the key states of Illinois, Indiana, and o Ohio. Um, now, you were concerned earlier in the year because of the late planting that perhaps pollination was going to come at a, at a bad time. Is that still a major concern? Well, that you? issue still hasn't been resolved yet. This crop is going to pollinate about two to three weeks later than expected, particularly in the western corn, but some of the corn uh, is very, very late mm -hmm. um, and it has been stunted. So that issue isn't going to be resolved, I, I really don't think, for another month or so. Um, also, we have to look at that high-pressure system down the southeast. Uh, that uh, continues to be a problem down there. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want that to drift up in here in, the, say, the July 15th through August 1st time frame. It would be very, very disastrous to the eastern Corn Belt in that our crop is so shallow-rooted. If it progresses from there into the western Corn Belt in their pollination, then, then, of course, you've got a very explosive situation. But what I want to say is the corn market seems to be acting a little bit independent. Uh, there are some good uh, fields of corn throughout the nation. Um, it did get planted. Uh, certainly it competes with wheat. And I think wheat, corn, and oats have kind of gotten a little bit lethargic based upon their own fundamentals. Whereas soybeans, because of the tightness, because of the high degree of volatility, because the media has really gotten on to it and really hyped it up, I expect the soybean market to, be, to remain quite volatile for the next two to three months, whereas the corn, wheat, and oats market may operate a little bit more independently than they normally would throughout, a, say, a normal marketing year, because their fundamentals by themselves really aren't, aren't as constructive long term. But beware if hot weather moves up in here, let's say, in that July 15th through August 1st time frame. Keep one eye on the weather, man. That's what Jim Bauer told us today here at Ag Day, and we'll be back with more in just a moment. For a report on the current grain price outlook, call Bauer Trading toll-free at 1-800-533-8045. In Indiana, call 1-800-346-5634. U.S. farmers are moving halfway across the world to Russia, but they aren't finding anything like Ag Day on TV there. Ag Day, it's the smart way to start your day. Get ready for our Monday morning chuckle. Captain Stubby's story is about a wealthy woman and a hog farmer. <laughs> and we had a farmer taking a load of hogs, taking a load of hogs in to sell, and his truck broke down right out on the highway. Oh boy, he didn't know what to do. He couldn't, didn't have any baling wire, couldn't fix it. So he started thumbing his way. Well, you know, nobody's going to pick him up. He had his hog boots on and overalls. So everybody shied away from him. So he saw a bus coming. So he jumped out in front of the bus, you know. Well, a bus stopped. And the bus driver made a mistake. He opened the door. And the farmer jumped right on. And he sat down and right across the aisle from an uppity woman. You've seen that kind. <laughs> Looked like she'd been weaned on a pickle. <laughs> and she sat there, you know. Pretty soon, that odor got ahead of her. Couldn't handle it. So she looked at the farmer and said, it looks like they'd run a special bus for farmers with hog manure on their boots. Well, the farmer said, they do, lady. You're on the wrong bus. <laughs> And that's all the time we have for now. We thank you for yours. I'm Al Pell, and for the entire Ag Day team, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>